you know, in the past, uh, I would open up one of these news videos with some headlines of all the stories we're going to cover, then hit you with the theme song. But uh, we're not going to be doing that today. And that's because, A, <laughs> the Bob Chapik story has, has created so many little stories, so many tangents, so many things to cover that, that, that there's just too many headlines to name. I'm, I, I, I couldn't get to it all. And two, I think uh, YouTube is hitting me with a copyright on the, on the theme song. So it may be that I can't use that song anymore. I've got to look into that. But for now, I'm playing it safe. I don't want to put the theme song in there. Let's get to the news. And we will be talking about some of the aftershocks of, of the Bob Chapik story. There's already been another termination. Kareem Daniel, formerly the chairman of Disney Media and Entertainment Distribution, is leaving the Disney company. There are rumors of who else might be leaving and also who might be ascending. And then there's the immediate reaction by Wall Street and what they think of, of the changes at the Disney company, which I have to say is kind of interesting, a little bit telling about what, what the finance sector thinks of, of the Disney company. And we're going to get to all that, but first, let's talk a little bit about how all of this started, because that's also one of the breaking stories, is that there was an origin to Disney finally deciding to let Bob Chapek go. Per reporting by the Financial Times, it began last summer, right about the same time when Disney had, or was, in the process of extending his contract for another three years. This was the thing that a lot of people <laughs> they couldn't get their heads around. Why would Disney fire Bob Chapek when they had just extended him? Why didn't they just not extend him back then? Well, there's a reason for that. Or I have a guess to that, but we're going to get into that in a second. Now, during that time, Disney executives left over from the Iger era had begun to uh, complain a little bit to the Disney board about feeling marginalized. And I would imagine they were also expressing their, their questioning whether or not he, you know, he had the fitness for the position. Chapek had let a bunch of people go from that Iger era, but not everyone. Meanwhile, he had also centralized the decision-making into those people who were Chapek loyalists, as it were, giving power to those who were close to Chapek, taking it away from those who were considered to be closer to Iger. Among those feeling marginalized was none other than Disney CFO, Chief Financial Officer, Christine McCarthy. She's the one who appears on all those quarterly reports. It's Bob Iger and Christine McCarthy. She's number two. She's number two in line to the leadership role of the Disney company. She's been with Disney since 1981. She uh, was promoted to the position of Chief Financial Officer in 2015, which puts her in, I would assume, the Iger camp. Now, per the report from the Financial Times, when these people started to speak up, the, the, the board didn't really know what to do. And I suspect that's because they didn't have anybody to replace them. First, they have to decide. Yes, these people are correct. Yes, Chapik is not fit for the job. Yes, he's, you know, uh, we, have, we have concerns about him marginalizing the voices of, of people that aren't close to him. They, first, they have to, to decide whether or not that's true. And then they have to decide if they want to just up and fire him. And if they're going to do that, You've got to have somebody who is capable to fill that position. You cannot just promote the next person behind you up into uh, that leadership position. That would have been what Christine McCarthy or maybe Josh Tomorrow. I mean, that's just, those two are not candidates. And this is a failing that goes back a long ways with the Disney company. This is not the first time, or this wasn't the first time that Bob Iger quit or tried to quit <laughs> being the CEO at Disney. We're talking, I don't know, three, four times he's tried to quit. He, for years, he was trying to quit. And they kept bringing him back. They kept you know, convincing him to stay. And it's because they didn't have a succession plan. And meanwhile, in all those years where, where Iger is trying to say, I don't want to do this anymore, they didn't do anything about it. The Disney board or the Disney company didn't do anything about it. They made no plans. They, they didn't make an effort to, to create a succession plan. So when he finally did quit in 2019 after threatening it for so long, uh, basically what they had left was Bob Chapek. And right after that, Iger had made it sound like through you know, various reports, uh, you know, interviews, et cetera, that Chapek was not his guy. He, was not, he, he wasn't his first choice. Probably I, he, he even knows where he ranks if, if he even had a choice. Now, you will hear people say when you, when you read articles about this situation that that Chapik was handpicked by Iger, but I simply, I simply cannot believe that that is the case. Just all you have, the, the two of them are the polar opposites of each other when it comes to management style, when it comes to 
just personality. And I, 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 I find it very difficult to believe that Iger would choose somebody, handpick somebody that is so opposite of him. And it's not like they didn't have plenty of history together. It's not like, you know, he didn't know who Chapik was. And that whole situation, that's just one of the most baffling things that I, I could ever come across for the Disney company. A company as immense, as big, as powerful, as notable as the Disney company had no succession plan. <laughs> I mean, and that's standard operating procedure for a company of this size. It is standard operating procedure in the business world to have a, even if you think that your leader, your, your, your leadership, your management, your president is, he's good. He's going to be here for a while. We're happy with him. No worries. You still have to have, you know, uh, a succession plan in case of emergency, you know, in case of anything, in case he does decide to quit, in case he gets a better offer, in case he passes, who knows? You've got to have a succession plan. And the fact that they didn't, the fact that they, they actively ignored that is just shocking to me. And it's a thing that kind of, you notice this in other parts of the business. They have a hard time doing sometimes the most basic things. They cannot, Disney is not capable of, of, of software. The, <laughs> the technology, software, the app, reservations, mobile order, all that stuff is just, they, they get it wrong. They break it so much. And I, this is a tangent but just something that I want to observe at this moment. I, I don't know why. They just can't figure it out. They can't figure that kind of stuff out. So obviously the board tried to write it out. They, they, they renewed him and they tried to write it out hoping things would get better. Uh, they, they did not. They, they got worse. So many unforced errors, so many comments that just rubbed everybody the wrong way, so many altercations, so many situations that wouldn't have happened. They wouldn't have happened under Iger's leadership. And per that report in the Financial Times, the final straw was, well, I should say close to the final straw was that Q4 report, that, that now infamous Q4 quarterly report where Disney, they, just, they, had, a, they had a really, really bad quarter. <laughs> and people started to talk. People started to say things loudly and out in the, you know, out in the open as opposed to whispering. The situation was compounded when Chapik put out that, that memo to staff later on that said, hey, man, things are rough, and we're going to have to start tightening our belt. We're going to have to make some cuts, and some of you have got to go. Curious. <laughs> I don't know if he ever imagined that one of those people that was going to have to go was him himself, Chapik himself. That's kind of ironic. Disney was in bad shape, and everybody started to realize that, that Chapik wasn't the guy, and Iger. Iger was the guy. Luckily for Disney... In this particular scenario, Iger had decided to make himself available. He had said in the past that that ship had sailed, that he was no longer going to you know, be part of the Disney company. He was done with that part of his life. I believed him, and I think he believed it too at, at the time. But you know, you go, you go a year or more watching somebody erode your legacy. You go a year or more watching somebody destroy the value of your stock because Iger is one of the Single, a single entity, you know, the Vanguard, BlackRock, they own a ton. They own hundreds of millions of shares of stock. But as an individual, Iger owned a ton, too. He was getting paid in stock, obviously. And to watch that get decimated, I'm sure, was probably not something that he was enjoying. So he had a lot of motivation to, to change his mind about whether or not he wanted to come back to the Disney company. I, and I, so the timing, I, you know, by the way, I would assume, in fact, that 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 Iger was one of those voices. He wasn't an executive at the Disney company complaining to the board, but he, boy, I think he made himself heard uh, to anyone who was listening who had, you know, uh, the, the power to let Chapik go. I'm sure that Iger was involved in that. And that's when the board decides, yeah, this Chapik thing, it's going nowhere. It's not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse. And it's all the result of something of an internal coup, uh, a, a revolution, a revolt within the Disney company against Bob Chapik and led, <laughs> it's so wild, led by Christine McCarthy. You almost, I felt like, I have to admit, I felt like Chapik and McCarthy were in cahoots, right? I thought they were in lockstep. They were in agreement on some of these things. This whole time when you hear McCarthy talking those quarterly reports, you know, in the back of her mind, she's saying, I don't believe this stuff. I don't, I'm not, I don't stand for this. You gotta wonder. And with that being the case, it does sort of answer a question that I asked in yesterday's vlog, when we were at the park about you know what Iger is going to do, one of the questions I asked is that well, there's you know rumors or suggestions that that Disney's not done letting people go, that there are more important, other important 
positions that are going to be vacated. The candidates, in my opinion, were the leaders of the three divisions outside of Marvel, because ain't nothing going to go happen to Marvel right now. Kevin Feige's good. Uh, Christine McCarthy, finance. Josh Tomorrow, Parks, and Pete Doctor, Pixar. But obviously, it's not going to be Christine McCarthy, so uh, maybe there are others. Matter of fact, we do know now uh, that Disney's chairman of media and entertainment is not so lucky. Kareem Daniel was let go early Monday morning. His, his title appears to cover a lot of ground, but the area most are pointing to is Disney+. Plus. That was under his leadership. He was also, per reports, a Chapik loyalist. He was close to Bob Chapik. Those two's careers were in alignment. And that was Iger's first move, his first real move as the returning CEO of the Disney company to let Kareem Daniel go. And it's a move that he said was part of a, a larger plan. This is an interesting quote. Per the statement from Iger, he's asked Dana Walden, Alan Bergman, Jimmy Pataro, and Christine McCarthy to work together to design a new structure that puts more decision-making back in the hands of our creative teams. Back in the hands of his creative teams. And that is a direct shot. It's something we just talked about a little bit ago about how Chapik had centralized the decision making into those uh, executives who were Chapik guys, who were part of the Chapik era. Meanwhile, with that statement, putting things back in the hands of the creative teams, he, what he's inferring is that Chapik's team, the, the people with whom he had centralized the decision making, were not creative. Elements of DMED, which is the Disney Media and Entertainment Distribution, will remain, but that he fundamentally believes that storytelling is what fuels the company and it belongs at the center of how they organize their business. Another shot at the Chapik group suggesting that storytelling was not at the center <laughs> of, of the Disney company, of, of the Disney process. Previous management did not put storytelling at the center of their operations. Chapik said words to that effect, but who of us, who among us actually believes Chapik when he says something like that? My guess, and this is just a feeling that I get, <laughs> I don't know anything, I'm not in the room, I'm just a guy with a YouTube channel, but my feeling was that, you know, he would say those things outwardly in the public, storytelling, <laughs> but you just know when it came time to make decisions, uh, you know, about films, it, it became more of a financial situation than it is an actual story. I don't know if... Maybe he does have a storytelling bone in his body. It just doesn't seem like it. And, and that was always the case. That was always the feeling that people had about Chapik. The people who didn't like Chapik was that was the feeling that they had. So moving on from that, as for other potential firings, as I mentioned, the other names that came up were, were Josh Demaro, uh, Pete Doctor, and, and Kathleen Kennedy. Did I, I forgot to mention her before, I think. And as it turns out, there are related stories for both. Kennedy's name came up yesterday when a Star Wars YouTuber, John Campea, reported Tuesday on his podcast that he's heard from some Lucasfilm insiders that Kennedy is not long for her job as head of Lucasfilm. This news obviously quickly spread around the internet, got everybody going, got everybody riled up, and naturally that's because Kennedy and her leadership of Lucasfilm has long been uh, a divisive topic. Ever since she took over, people have been, you know, uh, asking for her removal, as it were. Seems like there's always one story or another about how much everybody hates Kathleen Kennedy and that her, her removal is imminent, and then it doesn't happen. And then she gets renewed again, just like JPEG. Normally, I would say that this story wouldn't have gotten very much run. It would have been talked about within the Star Wars community, perhaps, but it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have gotten a wider run than it did yesterday. But obviously, because of the JPEG news, everybody wants to know, is this, is this related? Is this now a a byproduct, an aftershock of, of Chapik's firing. But if I had to guess, I would say no. I say that these are completely unrelated, that this story has nothing to do with Iger, and that this is just another red herring, another, another story to, to stir up the pot and to get people riled up about Kathleen Kennedy. If I were a betting man, uh, my bet would be that Kathleen Kennedy would, will, will fulfill her contract. She's uh, up for two, until 2025. She'll be around until then, but probably not after that. I do think that she, I don't think she will last. I don't think they would renew her again, unless something miraculous happens. Uh, I don't think they've got a Disney film, I mean, a Star Wars film planned until at least then. So there won't be another Star Wars film in production uh, or, or, or release until after 2025. So there really isn't much to buoy people's confidence in her. So uh, I don't, I, I think she'll serve till 25 and that's it. 
As for Josh tomorrow, he's a tough nut to crack. I mentioned in yesterday's vlog that I could not say anything <laughs> that Josh tomorrow has done. Be that a good thing or a bad thing. I cannot say for sure that he is responsible for anything that has happened in the in Disney parks. I couldn't point at a thing and say, that's a Josh tomorrow move. Now, I don't know if I should. Could I have even been able to say that in years past about Chapik, for example, when he was running parks? I feel like people did try to pin Galaxy's Edge on Chapik, which is an interesting conversation uh, because you want to pin things on Chapik for Galaxy's Edge and give Iger a pass. But then when Chapik ascends to presidency and something goes wrong in the parks, we still blame Chapik. Now, is that because it is Chapik? Or is that because he just comes off as a supervillain as opposed to, you know, uh, the, the Mr. Rogers type personality that, that, that Bob Iger has? That's another conversation. Um, but let's talk about that. Reservations, Genie Plus, uh, annual passes. Those are all parks issues. I feel like the, I feel like the whole world puts those on, on Chapik. I don't know if that's right or not. I can, can any of us say if those are Chapik moves or if those are tomorrow decisions? What about park maintenance, staffing, issues with, with uh, you know, negotiations, contract negotiations with cast, morale in the park? I, now, those I don't feel like would be Chapik situations. So if I feel like he, he may have had a mandate, Chapik may have said, hey, let's go, we got to go save some money out there somewhere. But I don't think those are Chapik moves. So I think we can. I think, I think we can put maintenance, park maintenance, and the failing. By the way, that's what I mean. The failing park maintenance, at least here at Disneyland. Or you could put that on Ken Potrock, for that matter. So does just Josh Tomorrow slide on everything? People want to love Josh Tomorrow because he's handsome and charismatic. And he came off great when he first ascended. When he was running Disney Park, or I should say Disneyland, and then when he first ascended to Disney Parks, he had a nice run there at the beginning. He, everybody loved Josh tomorrow. His, his shine was bright, but it is certainly wearing off now. And I, I feel like he is now suffering in the, in the wake of, of Chapik's uh, legacy. Uh, that is affecting Josh tomorrow for sure. All I can say is I have no idea what kind of executive he is. But I can say I do feel like I, don't, I cannot picture him as CEO. I just I cannot. And I mentioned that. <laughs> I mentioned that because there's another report that was suggesting that Dana Walden, who we referenced earlier, she's part of that team. Josh Tomorrow is not part of that team, mind you. Dana Walden is part of that team that is going to restructure the organization. She's a, a potential candidate for uh, grooming to become CEO, as was Josh Tomorrow in that article. I'm not saying that he actually is somebody that was saying or suggesting that he could be. I don't see it. In spite of his ascension in the Disney Parks ranks, uh, I just I don't I don't get a Disney CEO vibe from him. He probably need a ton of grooming. He needs more seasoning. That's a word that I've used in the past about tomorrow that he needs more seasoning, uh, and I don't think two years is enough uh, to to do that to get him ready for CEO. I think a decade is probably more like it. Um, so I don't I don't imagine him being, you know. A possibility for CEO. I don't know. I can't speak to Dana Walden, who was the other name mentioned. I can't speak to her. I don't know her at all professionally or, or in terms of her, her, her you know, experience or history with the Disney company. I can say, though, that she is the executive that replaced Peter Rice. So that obviously they, they think highly of her. Peter Rice was the one. Who, she, Peter Rice is the guy that, that, that Chapek fired uh, as a reflex when Chapek was going around axing people. Peter Rice was one of those, and he's another Disney Plus executive, a related executive. So uh, now having said that, that means that Dana Walden was promoted by Chapik, and yet she's on this panel. So she must be, she still must be, some, you know, some sort of Iger, you know, be, be seen positively by Iger at least. No, I think, uh, I think the smart money, when we're talking about <clears throat> Ascension, when we're talking about grooming somebody to be CEO, the smart money is on somebody from outside the Disney organization. And the even smarter money would be on Tom Staggs. Staggs was the Disney chief financial officer until 2010, and then uh, was made chairman of Disney Parks until 2015. That is who Bob Chapik replaced. When Chapik became Disney Parks chairman, he was replacing Tom Staggs. And if memory serves, 
his name was also being mentioned as a, a potential successor to Bob Iger when he was trying to leave way back then in 2015. That's how far back this goes. He's been, he left in 2019. Actually, he left and then came back for an even longer period. He'd only been gone for a year or two, to, you know, technically. Anyway, he had been trying to leave since at least 2015. Uh, Stagg's name was was mentioned, but not only did Stagg's not get that promotion to chief executive, he just wound up leaving the company entirely, which suggests that this was likely some kind of you know standard Hollywood power play situation where you know Stagg's was in the running and then he probably got outmaneuvered by Bob Chapik. I, I would think it, sound, it feels like Chapik won whatever struggle that was. Chapik ascends to chairman of the parks. Uh, Bob Iger sticks around because, you know, Staggs decides, you know, screw this, I'm out of here, right? Now, in a, in a weird twist for me personally, <laughs> I don't know how many of you are going to relate to this, Tom Staggs went on to create, uh, right after he left Disney, he went on to create Candle Media. He started that company with Kevin Meyer, who himself was also uh, an ex-executive at the Disney company. And Candle Media is home to some of our daughters, Sophia's favorite internet content. Uh, Moonbug is a Candle Media uh, production company. Moonbug is responsible for Rococo Melon, and they also uh, do produce some shows for, for Blippi, which you guys have heard me talk about Blippi before. So when I first found that news, that kind of shook me a little bit. I mean, are you kidding me? Tom Stacks is Coco Melon and Blippi? That's, that's great. <laughs> it's completely unrelated, of course, to this story, but I found that very interesting. And possibly even more interesting is that... Uh, Stagg's name came up again when <clears throat> Iger was trying to leave in 2018. In 2019, they were trying to figure out if, if Chapik was the guy. They were looking at outside sources. Stagg's name came up again in that conversation, but it wound up not being possible, I'm assuming, uh, because you can't run Candle Media and uh, Disney Company. And you would think that he, he would have some sort of allegiance to Candle Media, right? It's a company he started. He owns that company. So the only way that that would work Today, if they were to, in 2002 years, you know, at the end of Iger's current run again, I think the only way that that works is if Disney actually buys Candle Media, which uh, may or may not be an easy thing to do. They're probably going to have to pay a very hefty price. So they're going to have to pay to buy the company, and then they're going to have to pay stack. Oh, man. Getting somebody to run the Disney company seems like a very difficult thing. That you would think it would be easy, like everybody would be lining up to run the Disney company. But the, it's difficult because you need people of caliber and you have to convince people of caliber to do that. And the way you do that is with throwing a bunch of money at them and giving them a bunch of power. That's going to be tough. Uh, you know, that said, I think if you were to ask me, if you were to ask me to put a hundred bucks on who I think is going to be the next Disney president, I, right now, today, I'd have to put a hundred dollars on Tom Staggs. And that's where we are today. With leadership, there's still, we got, it's way early in this conversation to, to know more. So, you know, there's a lot more that's going to happen. A lot more stories that are going to come to uh, fruition from this. A lot more aftershocks, um, I, I suspect. One thing that we can observe today, one thing that is visible now, is Wall Street's reaction to the Chapik news. At first, they loved it. Uh, <laughs> overnight trading and early morning trading result in the stock shooting up quickly on Monday morning, going from just under $92 at opening to just over $100 uh, by 9.30 a.m. Things have chilled since then. Stock ended at 97 on Monday, then actually lost ground on Tuesday, hitting a daily low of 94 before bouncing back a bit to close at 96. In other words, uh, early optimism was high. People were excited. People wanted to buy Disney stock again. That drove the price up. But, you know, the, the, the people who, the actual finance guys, the actual stock traders, the people who do this for a living, uh, they, they kind of just took a step back and then things chilled out for a little while. And, and people started to recognize that in spite of the optimism with Iger, the Disney's financials have not changed one bit. <laughs> they have not changed at all since uh, Chapek was fired and Iger was hired. Uh, they're still in bad shape. The, there's, the, the Q4 report is still just as ugly as it was, and the outlook for Q1 is still not any better. It's not like Disney is suddenly going to make a whole bunch more money this quarter because Iger was hired. Sure, people are going to maybe, a few people, there might be a little blip, some excitement, but I, I don't feel like 
anything is going to change dramatically in how Disney operates in these next couple of months. So Q1 does not look very good for me. So that, I think that's what's happening there. Some people were expecting it to just skyrocket, but it's been pretty, it's been pretty temperate so far. And with that, such is the Disney company as of today, as of this, what is it? Wednesday afternoon. I don't know what time I'm putting this out. It's Wednesday morning as I record this Wednesday afternoon. Hopefully by the time you see this, if not Thursday morning, who knows? Hey, happy Thanksgiving, by the way. Uh, I, I'm hoping that nothing dramatic happens between now, between the writing of this story and the, re and the recording of it and the editing of it. I hope nothing dramatic happens between now and the time you guys get to see this video like it did for the last news update. I, <laughs> I did a news update talking about JPEG, et cetera, et cetera. I filmed the whole State of Disneyland report the day before all this happened. And it just, it, it, everything changes. And it's no longer even, <laughs> it's weird sometimes how much the script can get flipped. But that's where we are today. Uh, what do you guys think of all this? Let us know in the comments below. And then follow us on Instagram at underscore Fresh Baked. On Twitter at Fresh Baked Disney, that's Fresh with no E. And on TikTok at Fresh Baked Disney. If you like our show and want to show you support, please do consider joining our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash Fresh Baked. Otherwise, Thanks again for watching, everybody. We love you. Be safe out there. Be kind to one another. Fresh break. <sighs> I hope I don't have to do that. Got to keep that here. I don't know if you guys saw the uh, the video, the, the vlog that we did, and I made a few comments in there, man. I, I'm just glad. I mentioned this on Twitter too. I'm just one of the byproducts, one of the after effects for me personally is that I I feel like I can really truly love Disney the way I want to now. Like I'm at least it just feels good to have somebody that I I trust a little bit running the Disney company again. I feel like patience and and loyalty, you know, to the to the Disney company, people would say to me all the time, you, you got to vote with your wallet. Well, they don't really say that to me directly, to all the Disney fanatics out there, to the, to the, to the true believers. You know, but you're part of the problem. You're part of the problem. Things won't change unless you tell Disney that, that, uh, that you don't like it anymore and, uh, and that you're, gonna, you're not going to go to the park anymore. You're not going to you know, spend money. And... Maybe I never reached that threshold where I felt that way, uh, but it feels good. It feels really good to be able to walk through. It felt great to walk through Disneyland and just love it and just love being at the park and not have to worry about, <clears throat> you know, whether or not I'm part of the problem. <laughs> I mean, I don't really think it's perfectly legitimate. It's perfectly normal for there are a lot of companies out there who we probably, you know, don't fully support, you know. Uh, I, I, do we love everything that Coca-Cola does? I don't know. I have no idea. They could be doing some terrible stuff. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Home Depot, uh, uh, Target, you know, Costco, Walmart. We, we, we put our money all over the universe, and we may or may not support. People are just... – anyway, it just, it's just good that I, can, that I can feel good about going to Disneyland again. I, I enjoy that, and – I, I'll, that's, I just want to feel good about the Disney company, and, and Iger's hiring makes me feel that way. I'm sorry if you don't agree with me. You know, that was one of the things we, we heard a lot of. People were talk, going on about, uh, you know, why, why, why are you supporting the Iger? Why are you so excited about Iger? He's the guy who started this mess. And I don't, you know what, I get why people say that, I guess, but I don't believe it. I, I don't agree with that assessment. I'm sorry. <clears throat> The, 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 the issues that, that a lot of, well, at least me, myself, my issues were not with the debt, Fox, Disney Plus, the annual pass program, Genie Plus. I, I actually, I, I have, I live, I can, I can live under those conditions. I can live under the current conditions of the annual pass. I can live under the current conditions of Genie Plus. I can live under the current conditions of the reservation system. I can, you know, I, I can get past that. What I can't get past, what I didn't enjoy, was the feeling that I was being taken advantage of, the feeling that I was being used, manipulated, 
uh, that they weren't trying to cover at all the idea that they wanted more of my money. Now, you could say that Iger probably does the same thing, and I, you know that's fine. Maybe he does. Maybe he will. But at least I won't feel that way. You know what I mean? There's something about that man, that damn cardigan. He is 71 years old. He looks great. Uh, and this is probably the reason why, you know, going back to Josh tomorrow, it's probably the reason why people give him so many passes or he's gotten so many passes because, you know, he's just an affable, friendly, good-looking guy. There's something to be said for that, and that's why he's a candidate for no other reason, you know? Uh, and that's just the way it is for some of us. And I don't know, I can't say for sure, if, if Iger really does love me, <laughs> but I know that Chapik didn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, <laughs> that's saying something, right? That's got to count for something. I know, I know that Chapik didn't give a rip about me or my guest experience. He did not care about the guest experience. It's just plain and obvious for everyone to see. None of that mattered. What he cared about was being this Machiavellian mastermind. He was a super villain. Uh, you know, the, the things that he was trying to do with the pricing, with the flex pricing and the, uh, you know, trying to make it sound like, you know, sell tickets like he's selling tickets to an airline. Uh, you know, the reservation system, all of that just was about control and, and manipulation and, and wedging us into places that we didn't want to be. That's what he cared about. He cared about being a mastermind, I think. Again, just a guy with a YouTube channel, but uh, th those are my feelings. I hope you guys don't mind these rants. <laughs> All of this just now, totally unscripted. I would just love if, if, if Disney, if you're listening, if you're watching this rant, I think that you could, you could, you know, I mentioned this in the live stream the other day about Field of Dreams, comparing Disneyland to Field of Dreams. I would love it if Disney could find a way to convince us that we come first. I want Disney to find a way, if I had my way, to, to be able to convey the message that, that they love us and that, that we come first, not our money. That the guest experience truly does matter. I don't know how you do that, but that's, that's what I'm asking for. And then if you can do that, you can have all my money. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I know that there are people who spend significantly more than I do who are just dying and ready, ready to do it. But, you know, it's gotta, it, you got to give action to get action. I say that all the time. you got to give action to get action. You can't just ask us. You can't just ask, ask, ask and not give anything. You've got to do extra. You've got to go extra. Walt went extra all the time. He gave before he took. Well, actually, he didn't get. He didn't take. He gave, and then we gave him. That's why I love Walt Disney. That's why I love Disneyland because so much of what Walt did is still there in the parks, and the cast members are still there. The cast members understand that they give first, always, and that's why I love you guys. That's why I love cast members so much because that's the first thing on their mind is what can I do for you? Because they're not. They don't have a vested interest. Their paycheck isn't dependent upon whether or not I have a good time. They're getting, you know, their X dollars per hour. So their only mandate is to make us happy and, and to do things that, that they think we'll enjoy. I freaking love that about you guys. Maybe it's your mandate. Maybe it's just the way you feel. I don't care. I love you guys for that. And I love Disneyland for that. I got to stop talking. I got to go edit this video. I love you guys, Fresh Baked. I love you. We'll see you next time. Fresh Baked.